So let's go on a car journey together. I got a three hour drive ahead of me. I got the chocolate labs in the back. And I thought, why not do the Q&A this way? Right now, we're actually pulling out of my driveway. Oh, I wonder if I should do that too. I guess I shoulda, coulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda. All right, yeah, you know what? I'm going to fix something here. Let's go back. Okay, I think we're back in action, Luke. Oh. If you are going to knock over the camera, this isn't going to work very well now, is it? Okay. All right, let's try that again, Luke. There you go there. Ah, oh, for... Right, and nobody thinks filming your own self isn't freaking hard. Damn. Ah, okay. Let's see. All right, lots of time on you. 22% is going to go fast. Okay, hang on. Batteries. Check. All that. Just because a battery wasn't fully charged. Man. Where was I? Before I was so rudely interrupted by the dying battery. I was telling you that we were driving on my driveway, actually. Just heading out on my way to Collingwood, Ontario to visit a friend and uh, talk some business, some creative business. All right, shall we start? This first question comes from uh, Sam Brock. I've been wondering if you've ever felt your passion for survival slipping. Did it ever become just a job for you? especially given all the frustrations around the gatekeepers and shooting schedules. Perhaps my passion for Survivor Man maybe slipped uh, on occasion. Passion for survival. You know, the real answer is, is yes for a moment. And I think what it was was when, when people became so obsessed with survival, at that point I'd been doing it for 25 years. And so had all my cronies, all my buddies, people that you know I, I learned with and survived with and trained with uh, and was taught by. You know, we'd all been doing it for a long, long time. And then Survivor Man comes out and it, it uh, spearheads this whole genre of survival TV. And, you know, yeah, there was a time when it was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Another, another question about a fireboat, another question, you know. But then, you know, I think... After a while, what you do is you come, it's not about coming to terms with it or accepting your lot or anything like that. Much different, I think, or even making peace with it, I think, is too strong. I think, moreover, you just realize, you know, it's what brought me here. And I do still really love these skills. And I do still have a passion for teaching them. So, so you know, forget the, you know, the jadedness of, of thinking like, oh, really, another person wants to ask me a question about a shelter? Uh, I, I dropped that. And I think I only really had that passion slipping, as you put it, for kind of a brief moment in time. Uh, and I got over myself, basically. And that's what you have to do. You have to get over yourself. I think it's, it's like, you know, Billy Joel talking about not wanting to play Piano Man. And now... Uh, he plays it at the end of every single concert, or uh, just the way you are. He's, he said he just doesn't like playing that song because he feels like he's singing like a lounge singer. But now he'll he'll perform it in concert. And it's that same thing. It's like, yeah, but you know what? It's you. It's what we all know about you, and we, it's what it's one of the things that we love about you. Um, and we brought you here, you know. And you guys brought me to where I am even now. JT Yearsley, uh, instruments do I play in total? Mosquito in my ear. Uh, Hmm. Well, play, not very well. Uh, I suppose, uh, um, oh, for goodness sakes, the back one's falling down again. Test, test. Okay. But I see that it's still getting, test. Yeah, I think it's still getting the good audio. All right, I'll finish this question uh, for Luke and, and uh and then I got to reset that camera. Well, I write uh, and play and have a piano. I play um, a mountain dulcimer. I have a couple of mountain dulcimers, harmonica, guitar, 
And that's about it. However, what I found over the years was, I think we all have our own affinity. Musically speaking, if we are musicians, we have an affinity for certain types of instruments. And what I found was that, you know, anything stringed, any stringed instrument, I just love it. I love writing on it. I love the sound of them. Anything. But I suck at them. It's a real struggle. When you guys see me play guitar in concert and I've had a lot of wonderful compliments, I'm really just faking it to make it sort of thing. I'm making it look good, but in the end, I know I'm not very good at all. I just have a lot of fun, and so that's fine. But I find stringed instruments, they're difficult for me. I don't have a big, long finger span for, for fret stretch. That's frustrating. However, I did find along the way that every time I pick up any kind of instrument that is wind-based, I always feel really good with it, and I guess that's why I focused in on the harmonica. So the harmonica is the only instrument that I would say I have any real confident chops, as they say. Um, you know, where you could invite me to go up and play with, uh, I play with Johnny Lang, or Journey, or Alice Cooper, uh, Bruce Coburn, the list is starting to go on, which is really cool. Uh, so I could play with any of them and feel confident and say, yeah, bring it on. But guitar, nah, -uh, no way, I'm, like, I'm not stepping up on stage with you know, uh, some great player with the guitar in my hand. No, I use it for writing, and, and when I play solo, I play my guitar, and I, and, I do, and I solo on songs and stuff like that, but again, I'm kind of faking it. So those are the instruments, really. All right, so what, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna pull up to the stop sign that's uh, just up here. I'm gonna shut all you guys off. I'm gonna retie up that camera so that it stays on me. This is, you know what? Side anecdotal story here. This is what filming yourself takes. I've been in and out of this car 15 times trying to set these cameras up. Batteries die, cards too full, reformat the card, camera falls over, dog knocks over camera. All this stuff that goes on. When you're filming yourself, it is a lot of work. And then the best is when you finally settle in but there can be an incredible amount of frust with, with Survivor Man. There would be an incredible amount of su su frustration. How many times the camera would fall over, and you know the editor would hear me swearing my face off because it's like, come on, you know, it'd slip over, and worst case, it would slip over and fall into some water or into the mud or something like that. Or I'd get up, I'd be set here, I go, this is perfect. Or I'm in the middle of like a fireball or something, and the camera would die on me. Very, very frustrating. Very, very difficult work. Uh, and all I'm trying to do right now is a Q&A for you guys while I'm driving. And um, yeah, this is a great reminder of what it used to be like with Survivor Man. All right, I'm coming up to the stop sign. So uh, to be continued. Okay, I'm back. Believe it or not, since I just shot that little scene, the two, first two questions in the Jeep, it has actually now been almost two weeks. That's how chaotic my life can be, or at least that's how distracted my life can be. So yeah, it's been almost two weeks since I actually drove out of the driveway and then had to come back and then stopped, and here we are. In that time, what have I done? Oh, actually in that time I went on a bit of a vacation down to Kennebunkport, Maine, Goose Rocks Beach, where I got yelled at for having my dog off a leash. That was a lot of fun. In any event, I'm here now, and I'm ready to go right back at your questions again. Hopefully everything is cool, and this setup will work, and I'll get right down into it. But not before getting up this morning. Weather's changed. We're now getting into September. The morning temperatures here were eight, was 8 degrees Celsius. And so uh, still, that means got to go down, got to jump in the lake in the morning, wake up the soul. It's awesome. In fact, check it out. This water's getting pretty chilly, isn't it, puppy? See, I told you, that was this morning, just a few hours ago. Had to kind of wake up from too much wine last night. All right, let's get into these questions. Okay, Brandon Brooks writes, what are your top five favorite beers of all time? <clears throat> let's give a nod to how I grew up. First one would be Molson Golden, which was my father's beer, and that was the first one of getting 
a taste of beer. Second one would be Molson Export because when you were a teenager in the 70s in Mimico, Ontario, and you ordered your beer like this, X, uh, but before you could get in the bars, that's what you drank because that was like the cool beer. That's what everybody drank. Only the weirdos drank like Labatt's Blue. But we all grew up drinking Molson Export. So that's still going to be on the list of my top five favorites. Uh, after that, I loved Stella. Uh, Stella was a favorite crisp, clean beer for a long time. And then Guinness. I was introduced to Guinness. And number five would be anything that is a deep, dark, chocolatey stout, but especially the Rogue Ales. Um, they've got a double chocolate stout in a red bottle. They've, they used to be in a red bottle for Val Valentine's Day. Or the Rogue Ale uh, Nitro Chocolate Stout. Awesome. So there you go. That answers that question. Brandon Brooks, Alan Hoffman. Have I ever been, met the big front man for Midnight Oil, Peter Garrett? No. I don't think. He probably came... No. He came into Much Music when I was a producer there in 1985. And I probably would have met him then. But I will say, loved... Beds are burning. That song kicks ass. Soapy balls. Hey, it's just a name I'm reading it. Unless you open one of your productions with a quote, and I wish I could remember the whole thing in its entirety, entirety but I cannot. It has been bugging me for months. What I remember along, is along the lines of, I don't fear the cold. I don't fear the extreme heat. I don't feel the large, scary animals. What I do fear is the wind. Please, if you would be so kind as to restate that, the quote and or give me a hint as to which episode. No, because I don't remember. So maybe somebody on there will jump and put it down below. Or if Luke, the editor, happens to know what that's from, he can pop it in. But if not, uh, someone else is going to answer that because I don't remember either. BKNRNG asks, have I ever heard of Hinterland Studios and the video game The Long Dark? Yes. Mike A. asks, were there times that you didn't complete the week and finish an episode due to an injury or the weather turning rough or some other unforeseen circumstances? Just uh, as you've already seen the Labrador episode, which was my fault. They came in and said, we have to leave. And the other one that I kind of cut out a bit early would have been in Utah because I was pretty severely dehydrated. Willie Walrus, are Crocs the greatest foot attire of all time? According to Deadpool, yes. According to me, no. Does anybody else out there still love their mandals? I gotta say, I mean, I loved wearing mandals when they first came out. They were, we used to just call them tevas. And when I was a uh, canoe guide, you'd wear tevas while canoeing, while portaging a canoe and whitewater paddling, all that. And man, well, you, you really messed up your toes, something awful on a lot of occasions, like getting a stick jammed right into your toes as you're holding, you know, carrying a canoe and a portage pack across the trail. But I loved my tevas. Now you can't wear them because they're called mandals and they just don't look right. Don't ever wear your sandals or flip-flops with socks. Don't do it. I don't care how old you are. Just don't. Clutchman, if Survivor Man had been created nowadays, or live streaming had been made easier back when Survivor Man was still in production, would I have used live streaming as a method of doing Survivor Man? Under the assumption I could maintain a stable connection out there. Absolutely, Clutchman. Uh, and I still, I actually plan on doing it. The trick is the stable connection. Now, um, I actually do now have Starlink, and I'm looking at potentially, if we go and do another Survivor Man, of utilizing that Starlink so that there is at least some resemblance of a live streaming while I'm actually out there. Shane Seward, I find when I'm in the wilderness, I get in tune with the surroundings. My sentence heighten and I'm hyper aware. Sound, smell, humidity, topography, vegetation. I think you know what I mean. It's almost spiritual. Do you feel the same connection in other more from unfamiliar environments? Or is it more like being in an alien world? Oh, absolutely more like being in an alien world. I don't feel that connection unless I'm in the wilderness. And some may be able to say they can get it in, I don't know, a yoga studio or a meditation chamber or something like that. I, I, that's fine. Good for them. For me, anywhere that isn't the natural world feels like an alien world to me. Daniel Morris asks, I've never seen someone with so much... <laughs> okay. Hang on. I'm going to need a drink of water before I answer this one. Ah. Okay, where was I? Before I was so rudely interrupted. Daniel Morris asks this question. Okay, before I read this, warning, potty mouth coming. Okay, if you don't want any potty mouth, 
skip this next question. You've been warned, especially if you're sitting there with your kids. Here we go. I've never seen someone with, someone with so much undeserved ego, LOL. Seriously, LOL. You're famous for us watching you suffer in the woods. That's all. Remember your place. Well, Daniel, uh, fuck you. Okay, Shira Brockett. My son Tristan and I watch Survivor Man all the time. I purchase them all and we download and watch. His question is, besides your car accident, that was in Mongolia, what has been your worst injury or sickness while filming Survivor Man? While filming Survivor Man, worst injury probably would have been in the Amazon jungle where I sliced my, my thumb pretty good. Um, and I think, no, that was Costa Rica, in Costa Rica when I sliced my thumb. Luke, show him that. Oh, the monkey's right above me here. Oh, damn. I just sliced my finger open. And it wasn't even worth it. Because this vine's too thin to drip for me. Okay, that was just plain stupid. Looking up to a couple of silly monkeys throwing things at me. Oh. And I end up, I hit the bone with the knife. I could feel kunk like that. that. Just that feeling of going in deep. It stopped bleeding. I just kept it pressed for a while. And uh, just with my mouth just kept it held tight. But uh, man, that hurt. That was stupid. And it, there was no even, not even any payoff. There was no water in the vine, for goodness sakes. So I'm going to just make a bandage out of my Scooby-Doo underwear. Try and keep the dirt out of this thing. Infection in the jungle is one of the most insidious circumstances to deal with. It can just leave you in agony. So that one actually really festered for a while. The next one was actually getting foot fungus in the Amazon jungle. Check it out. But the worst thing right now is the fact that I'm dealing with some pretty bad foot fungus. It's right across the five toes on my right foot. And uh, I don't know, I'll have to see how that goes if I end up uh, getting real bad tomorrow with it. It's not worth losing any toes over, that's for sure. So uh, I, might have to, I might have to call it if that's the case. But as far as sickness is concerned, I definitely, uh, you've heard these stories before, I picked up parasites uh, that have done me in for quite a while after Survivor Man when I'm back home. Uh, but uh, that's about it. You know, the thing is, I don't really usually get sick. That would be what would happen to me more often than not rather than injuries. The reason why I don't get injuries is because I'm slow and I'm boring and I'm safety conscientious. It's about survival. I'm teaching you how to go through a, a, a really rough ordeal and you can't just bolster your way through and run and jump. All that crap that Bear Grylls used to show is deadly and dangerous for actual survival. You need to walk methodically, plan out your routes, know what you're doing, and be calm, cool, and collected. No running and jumping. That's why I really don't have any injuries. Very, very few. Uh, and uh, you got to remember that. That's the way to go through the wilderness in a survival situation, cautiously and calmly. But on the way to film Survivor Man in Mongolia, uh, I was in a double rollover in a, in a, I guess it was in a land cruiser. And uh, that took me out of commission for a full year. Uh, I ended up with uh, three busted ribs, punctured lung, two dislocated shoulders, and a concussion. In fact, Luke, go ahead and show them the Mongolia piece. There you go. So all I saw was the glass coming at my face, and I thought, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. And I went shoulder into the side, and it was when we first hit, because it was a hard hit. Bam. And then we just kept rolling, kept going. I thought it was going to stop right there, but it didn't stop. It's true what they say, it all, it all happens in slow motion. In the process, of, I'm like, nobody get hurt, nobody get hurt. Like that, let's roll and come up, and that's it, we're done. It's just a bad roll. And, and just as I was thinking that, that's when I hit. Well, Max, that's the end of this shoot.
Okay, the goodest boy, B-O-I, what are the best sceneries in Canada to visit, hike, or wander through? Oh, man, all of Canada. I live in Muskoka right now, so Muskoka is world class, especially at the end of September when all the leaves turn color. But of course, all of it, really, it's, it, with Canada, you can't, you can say, oh, well, the prairies aren't as beautiful as Banff. That, it's not true. The prairies are gorgeous. Um, in fact, the only drive I don't actually like doing in all of Canada, well, there's two. One would be from the Alberta border going west to Calgary. That section, ugh. Sorry, guys, if you live there, but, man, that's a rough one to get past. It's about six hours, I think. The other one is the 401 going down to Windsor, south of London, Ontario. That stretch to the border, you just want to, as you're driving along. It's horrible and really ugly. The rest of Canada, all of it, awesome. And I'm not copping out. I really mean that. All of it is stunning and beautiful. So, coming from Germany, pick a spot on the map. You won't be disappointed. It's Canada, man. Real Swerbs TV asks, big fan of my work, was the India episode meant to be a two-parter? No. No, but I know why you're asking. Uh, and I'm sure that question comes up again later. Everybody's like, well, well what happened in India? Well, what do you think happened? <laughs> I, I eventually climbed out of the tree and I, and I, and I went home. I, I left. I finished. It was funny because creatively speaking, as a filmmaker, we wanted to start having, like Barry Farrell and I, we wanted to start having fun. I mean, even, that was pretty late in the game, always trying to throw in something, just a little different, different production, different creative idea, different way of doing things. So that, let's just leave the episode on a cliffhanger. It's not like they don't know or that you don't know what's going to happen to me, but it's fun to mix it up in the filmmaking world. But oh my goodness, did that ever cause a stir? Like, well, what happened? We don't know. Like, what happened at the end of India? Or when I let the dogs go in Labrador? Like, this, the, the notes you'd see on social media. Bottom line was, uh, I just, no, it wasn't meant to be a two-parter. I was, I was finished. So you didn't need to see me walk out. You knew I was going to do that. M asks, snowshoes in solitude for the first time the other week when you mentioned, or I guess they saw it, when, you, when I mentioned, I mentioned, cannibalizing the camera used to film on that Survivor Man episode. Is this something that would ever get a commentary? I can't wait till we hit the director's commentary episode of Survivor Man and Son. Short answer to your question, Em, is I'm going to be doing all of the episodes. So if I've missed one, you'll get it. What's my favorite cultural experience during my training before the Survivor Man episodes? Cultural experience, that would have to be with the Warani in the Amazon jungle. Uh, and in fact, uh, right now, Luke, my editor, uh, is working on uh, the, we found them. We found the original videos of me learning and training for Survivor Man in season one and season two of Survivor Man. So uh, we're putting those together right now and we're going to be able to show you never before seen footage of me training in a certain location, like say for example in Arizona. In fact, Luke here, show them just a little tease, a little tease of Dave Halliday teaching me the handrail in Arizona. Check this out. I taper mine at the top so I can float for a while before I get started. Get some gear action going in there. Try to get your, use your whole, the, the idea is you know, to get, I try to make my hand go up at the last there so you can, and maybe get them wet. Go for it. find yourself slipping to lick your palm once in a while. See what I mean? So I have hours of that in different places of me learning from masters uh, and we're putting that together right now to launch on this channel. Uh, was there any cultural shocks particularly jarring for this frostbitten Canadian boy? Cultural shocks. I don't shock easy. I definitely had a lot to learn. Um, you know, there was cultural disgust in discovering how polluted, you know, Indonesia can be, places like Kosamui and that, uh, just how disgusting that can be. There was certainly shocks of learning how remote certain peoples are and you get out there and they've got nothing, but then they've got a watch on or something that was given to them by a missionary. This particular village you can access by vehicle. That means access to the outside world pretty readily. 
modern clothes in the town and village. There's uh, some sinks and taps and cutlery, plates, those types of things. Lots of access to modern implements, but still living a fairly primitive lifestyle when it comes to certain aspects like hunting. Uh, things like that were always a little strange, like in the, in, with the Warani, for example, in the Amazon jungle, uh, or the, the Hewa in Papua New Guinea. I wouldn't say shocks, I would say wake up calls for me as to what actually goes on out there in the rest of the world. And in many ways, those experiences while doing Survivor Man led me to do the series Beyond Survival. If you haven't seen that series, check it out. It's on the playlist. Uh, I, I don't know if we've got a promo. Luke, if we do, show them a promo for Beyond Survival. Odyssey Eduardo, what would be the best advice for the rest of us trying to film solo in a wilderness environment? Be ready for the work. It's hard work. Let it be hard work and do it. That's what it comes down to. It's not easy to film alone in the wilderness. Make the extra trek across the swamp to get the wide shot. Make the extra climb up the cliff to get the wide shot from up above. Try to plan your shoots around not having to redo anything. But if you have to redo something, like a walk across a beaver pond or something, then redo it so that you get the story caught. But just be ready for the work. Hard, hard, hard work. Gold asks, is it easy to learn harmonica? You know what, it's easy to get to a place where you can blow a few tunes, for sure. And my advice, I, I loved, starting with uh, James Cotton. That was my favorite artist, harmonica player to, to learn from in the beginning. And don't forget, every song's in a different key, so you need different harmonicas. You can't just grab a C harmonica from the store and play what you hear on the radio or on some album. You have to figure out what key that guy is playing to try to match up. And you play along, and it doesn't sound the same. It's because you're in the wrong key. Dan8308, the crew picks me up at the end of seven days. Do I leave them instructions like, have the biggest burger waiting for me in the car? Yes, I do. Absolutely. The rule was you better have the biggest, most awesome pizza, uh, double cheese, pineapple, mushrooms uh, ready for me, and a nice big couple, a couple of cold Guinness. Uh, or not, not, they don't even, Guinness doesn't even have to be cold. Just a couple of Guinness. Not in a bottle. Never Guinness in a bottle. Don't do it. Should be, should be banned. Okay, Charlie, hey Les, would I go back and redo Labrador Survivor Man again? If so, how would I improve myself or what did I regret doing in that episode? I regret not having more time with the dogs ahead of time. I would have, been, would have liked to have been better trained with them. I mean, I was trained, but I needed to train them to my voice and to me. I spent a lot of time fighting with those dogs to keep them on track. So, so much of that, and you didn't see any of that because it's not like I could always, you saw some of it, but I couldn't film a lot of that. Uh, um, you know what, Luke, show them some of the mess it was, me trying to handle the dogs in the Labrador episode. It's an aggressive activity. I have no more trouble from them. I can slowly let myself cool down, dry the sweat. I've been traveling all day now, and I've got to get in close to the bush and out of the wind, but the dogs are confused. They think I want to return, so they keep heading me back the way we came. I could easily fall off the sled at a time like this and lose them. It's a very dangerous situation. If I can't get them in close to the bush and on their night chain, the possibility of a dogfight becomes way too strong. Shiloh is insisting on going back home and keeping her straight is exhausting work. Then the worst happens. The only way to stop one of these dogfights is to become as angry and as tough, and in fact, tougher than the dogs themselves. If I don't, they may rip apart each other into a bloody mess and in some cases have even killed their own. No musher can afford to let that happen and my soft rubber boots amount to a slap on the wrist for these extremely tough dogs. But you know, honestly, 
Labrador was kind of a gift to me. I traveled by dog team. I had a big sleeping bag. I ended up in a survival shelter. That was almost like camping for me in some ways. I mean, the food wasn't there, obviously, and I still had to show what you need to do. But that was one of the points in an episode like that was, look, at sometimes there are survival cabins. Let's make use of that. Let me show. So you're in a cabin. That doesn't mean you have any food, right? So uh, I, I loved showing different aspects of survival, including when you had some advantages. Labrador was very cool for that. Hunter Hertzfeld asks me, what was my thought process in selecting the knives and tools to bring on each survival adventure? Did I try to base the tools on the scenario I presented, like a machete to Costa Rica? For example, because a kayaker from a resort probably wouldn't have one. No, you're, you're right there. That was just a flub of mine. I mean, if I thought about it, yeah, you're right. A kayaker would not have had a machete. Uh, and I did, but you know, I was mixing and matching and trying to think things through. It made sense to have a machete in the jungle. So I probably, I probably, I, I think in the future, in the future, did he just say in the future? He did. In the future, what I would do is really truly match up what items I have to the scenario. And there were times within the series of Survivor Man where I realized, why do I have that ax? Like a guy in that situation wouldn't have an ax. Or, you know, why do I have that fishing gear. A person in that situation wouldn't have fishing gear. And I would rather make sure that it was really true to the storyline. I didn't always do that. Did, any, did the size of the tools hamper my ability to build things? And he's thinking of the raft in Georgia. No. No. That's my answer. Joey J. Mentioned training working with the Canadian Armed Forces. Did they approach me? The, uh, are you allowed to talk about what type of training, how many days, how difficult, etc.? Uh, as a Canadian, I think it's awesome that I work and teach with them. Yes, I was really honored and uh, had an amazing time working with the JTF2 Task Force, I believe is what they were called. Uh, young uh, men and women, although it was all, all men at this point, I think, uh, who were looking to become better trained and more elite within the Canadian Armed Forces. Went out, uh, worked with my good friend Alan Beauchamp, an amazing survival instructor. Knows he's forgotten more than I'll ever know when it comes to wilderness survival, and um, train them. What, you know what I always wanted to do when it comes to training the military and working with them is get them to learn survival, and whether it's a desert or forest or Arctic, what have you, without their kit. But I'm always limited to they must do this with their kit. And I always want to say, want to say but what if they don't have their kit? And uh, never was re really able to convince the, the uh, you know, commanding officers that that would be the best route to go. Let me teach them with no kit, at least for one night, with nothing. And that would have been, that's, it's tougher. It's a tougher go. I mean, uh, I'm, I, now I get the chance to do that with search and rescue uh, with the guys that I work with down in Oregon. But again, really if I had my druthers, I'd have them out there with nothing, at least one night. You want to see what it's like here? This is what it's like. Maybe I will. Maybe I will adjust the course to say, why don't we have you out there as a victim first? Ah, oh, it's the best way to learn. All right. Paul Smart, I'm curious, what was my favorite filming location? I know, were there any? I just rolled my eyes and thought, no way in hell, but did it anyway. Um, no to the second one. I mean, you know, people, oh, why don't you do it on the side of a volcano? Why? Why? That's just, that's just a suffer fest. And there's the thing, right? If you look at the difference between what I do and did in bringing Survivor Man, you know, onto television, was I was never going to make that series about being a sufferfest. It was about uh, learning the skills. So again, it's a big F you to Daniel who, who tells me to keep my ego in check. Like, you didn't watch me suffer when I was out there. Not at all. In fact, it was more about how can you make yourself the most comfortable. I mean, that's, that's the, one of my biggest points. People go out with me on a camping trip. They think they're going to suffer. I'm like, are you kidding? I have the best gear ever. I want to be comfortable out there. Being comfortable in the wilderness is an art form. So a suffer fest was not anything for me to get involved in while filming Survivor Man. I was teaching survival skills. Sure, granted, it was rough, and I had a rough go in certain places. But my objective was to teach you how not to have a rough go if you're caught out in a survival situation. Oh, and my favorite, favorite filming location, Paul Smart. You know, it's probably always going to be, as far as survival goes, on a tropical island. So easy. So fun. Luke, show him something from Cook Islands. Oh, boy. <laughs> Welcome to dinner. We've got, of course, my favorite, coconut centers, palm heart, 
roasted coconut center. Mm. Coconut roasted clam. My root juice in a beautiful coconut cup. And of course, my coconut juice. Which I think maybe what I'll do is I'll add a little, mix the two together. There we go. Nice. What a smorgasbord. Well, I can tell you, this is going to be fantastic. And all of this was gathered really in, in not very much time at all. Warren Larkin, have I ever failed a survival situation? Evidenced by the fact that I'm sitting here right now, I'm happy to say no. Renault, what would I say is the place that was the most awe-inspiring to me, a place that took my breath away? And what was it that made it so special? Potentially, well, the high Canadian Arctic. I mean, I would joke that I could just take this camera and throw it on the ground and it will get a good angle in the Arctic. The Utah Canyon lands took my breath away. And lastly, the high Andes of Peru while filming Beyond Survival with the Incan high priests. Uh, just gorgeous. All right, a few more to go. I'll tell you what, when I run out of water, I'll stop this one and we'll get it uploaded. Decatur Oglesby, with the dogs or the horse in another episode, do I still have the lonely feeling like other episodes? Not as bad. Good question. Not as bad. I still have yet to do an episode with my dogs, which I intend to do for you. Uh, did he say that he intends to do another Survivor Man? It kind of sounds like I did, didn't it? Uh, and no, it is different. When you have your dogs, when you're with horses, there is a slight lessening of the feelings of loneliness and depression and boredom, crushing boredom. But you've got these animals. I got to admit, it does help a lot. C.G. Breaky. Oh, this is a long one. Oh, oh, okay, interesting. Great one to ask. In many episodes throughout the series, including this one, this referencing, originally these questions were underneath the Labrador director's commentary. But in many episodes throughout the series, including this one, there are photographs of me out there in the places where I was in the episodes. Were those photographs taken while I was out there? Or were they recreations of what you did uh, and went through during the week? There's some recreations. Some, there are some photos that depict exactly how you were in a, few, in a few moments and in a few cases, like in this Labrador episode, where it seems to have been too difficult for me and a photographer to go back to the places I was just to get those pictures. In this case, the melting of the ice meant you and the entire crew had to go back to safety as soon as possible. So how were the pictures taken? With the photographers out there with me, like Laura Bombier, did she visit me periodically? How were those logistics? So that's a great question, CG, and, and I've been meaning to, uh, I, I knew this question was coming. I love answering it. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, did, you know, it, it requires a little bit of history here. Understand that when it comes to the photography of a documentary series being filmed, uh, there is no budget allowed for you to, as an executive producer, as a producer, to bring a photographer to shoot and get great photographs. So often what series will do is they'll set up a photography day and they'll go and they'll do all of the shooting. The problem with that and Survivor Man is that I, I just don't look the same. In my case, if I were to set up uh, photography days, the problem is I don't look like me when that happens. You know, I probably sh I sh showered that morning, I'm clean. Yeah, what am I gonna do, the Bear Grylls thing and put dirt on my face? I mean. If a picture you ever saw of Bear Grylls all dirty, it was from a makeup artist for crying out loud. You know, and so I never wanted to, to, be, to be that fake and phony where it's like, let's do a photography day now. So uh, what was going to be the compromise? Well, we couldn't have, uh, and it was often Laura Bombier. So Laura Bombier was the official photographer for Survivor Man, and she came out on many, many episodes to photograph me. Her complaint was, well, how am I supposed to photograph you and capture you in the thick of it when I'm not allowed to come out while you're filming? Well, that's right, you're not. And she didn't. Was it frustrating to know that in reality you couldn't be out with me during the best part of the action that was going to take yeah. place? Yeah, very frustrating because it's, again, as a photographer, the kind of photographer that I am, you're missed opportunities, right? So... For me, getting photographs of you that are magazine worthy or um, authentic, you know, you're covered in dirt or, you know, you're covered in bites, you're hungry, you're, you know, that stuff comes through in, in, the, in the photographs. I think there was one or two episodes where she came out with like Max Atwood 
in the middle to br and he would to bring me some batteries or cards and she would get some photographs. I hated it. We did that once or twice. I said, you know what? I, I can't see you guys. I'm in the middle of doing this. They wouldn't bring any food or water or anything. So it was kind of weird and it threw me off my game. So I said, nope, we're not going to do that. Well, then where can I, when can I photograph you? So I said, all right, I'll tell you what. At the end of every week of filming Survivor Man, at the end of it, I'm still filthy, I'm still dirty, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, my eyes are baggy, perfect time to catch me in mode. I had to a lot, and I usually only gave her two hours. I said, I'll give you two hours, then I gotta eat. Because even if I'd eaten, it would change everything. So no food, no pizza, no Guinness. And they'd come to pick me up in the Amazon jungle, in the Arctic, uh, where, wherever, all of them, every single one of those episodes. And it was like, Laura had me for two hours. Go. And, well, what did you hear? Did, what else did you do? Because they don't know what I did at this point. I just filmed it off of last week. I was like, well, you know, I got a shelter a couple of hundred yards back. Okay, let's trek through there. Let's get to that shelter. Got to get some shots. Okay, climb in your shelter. Now come up. And we would do this whole photo shoot. She had two hours at the end of every Survivor Man episode. And that was that. But the thing, I, why I mentioned that so many uh, productions you know, they don't have that budget in there because the network is, is usually paying the bill and the network won't allow. So they get to this thing where it's like, oh, you know, the producer can just take some shots, you know. And all producers think they're good photographers. Got news for most of you. You're not. You're not real photographers. You've got an expensive camera. You take a nice family photo of your family on vacation, but you're not real shooters. A real photographer is an artist. And... Sadly, that's an art that's, you know, being lost. That's a skill that's being lost. Great photographers, I worship at your altar. I bow to your skill set. You guys are amazing. Uh, Laura Bombier is a brilliant photographer. Her work with shooting children is unparalleled. And so, but she knew her demands had to be met to get, because I wanted good photos from her. So there was the compromise. Two hours, two hours at the end of every week, go into the bush, try to relive some of it for her in two hours and get those shots. Uh, now, the result of that though, and, and so, oh, by the way, I paid her fee out of my own pocket. I said, okay, screw you network. I'm just going to, you know, and so again, to you photographers, again, absolutely huge respect. And if I was working with you, that's what I would do. I'd say, you know what? No, you're not coming out for free. I will pay for you, pay for you to be there and get these shots. Well, the result of that was I'm probably on, I think I'm on over 30 magazine covers. And I, I would bet that at least half to three quarter the quarters of those covers I'm on because when they, once they saw her photos, when we would send them in the selection, they go, oh, crap. Okay. Well, since we're featuring all the survival shows that are on TV, but this photography work of Les is amazing, boom, on the cover I go. So huge respect to Laura Bombier, huge respect to all photographers. You guys are artists, stay artists, and know all you people who think you're just as good as them with your dumbass iPhones, you're not. I don't care what filters you put on it. A true photographer is an artist. They deserve the respect of being artists. Paul Nicklin, Hands down to you. Also worship at your altar. Amazing shooter. Um, uh, Sean Heinrichs. Uh, and of course, Laura Bombier. Again, couldn't swear When you did the preamble the week before shooting, how did I approach that? Did I have a list of questions I always asked or just got into the flow of the guide? Uh, and how much did that week prepping change the outcome of the show? Definitely, I went with the flow of the guide. I mean, the guides in a certain area, they know what they need to teach me. Now, that said... Let me backpedal a little here because, in truth, they do know what they need to teach me, but they don't know what will film well. So sometimes a guide, say a David Halliday or somebody in, in Costa Rica, uh, they might be teaching me something, but they don't know what films well. And sometimes I'd be like, this is a great skill this person is teaching me, and I'm going to be quiet and listen and learn it, but I'm, there's, there's, I got nothing here to film. This is not going to be anything I can film next week when I'm out here doing this for real. So I would, you know, steer them into a direction where, look, I really need to know all the wild edible plants that are available right now. For example, somebody would be teaching me a wild edible plant, but it, it, it's not going to be in season while I'm there. I don't need to learn that. This is like, let's not waste the time on those berries if, there aren't, if they aren't going to be there. 
So let's get to what you can teach me that is going to be there. That was a big thing for me. And by the way, that was one way in which I judged my guides. Wild edible plants is the last thing that most people learn when it comes to survival. I don't know why, but it is. Then go for the sexy stuff, fire starting, shelter building, atlatls, bow and arrows, you know, all that stuff. Wild edible plants, oh, pasha, pasha. You know, that's for, I don't know, guys think it's for women and, uh, and people keep it to the end. It's stupid. It is my favorite part of survival. It always will be, which is why I now have the series Les Stroud's Wild Harvest, which was just featured on LA Weekly. Show that clip from that magazine there, uh, Luke. And while Luke is showing you that, there it is, in LA Weekly uh, being featured as the top food show uh, to watch this year. Uh, and I adore doing Les Stroud's Wild, Les Stroud's Wild Harvest because it's all about the wild edible plants. Go ahead, Luke, show them the promo. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Hey there. Oh! Go on! Now the job's getting fun. This dish is a showcase of how great these forged ingredients come together. It's the best when it's its own flavor. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. So what I was going to say was that I would ask the guide to be, do you know any wild edible plants? And when they knew a lot, I thought, I'm in good hands. But many of them be like, oh, you know, there's a couple plants, but I don't really know them. It's like, okay, so you're going to show me, you know, hunting techniques and tr that aren't going to work because I'm not there long enough and, you know, fire starting techniques that I already know, you know. So, and, and I realized that, that, you know, a lot of experts, they weren't really experts if they didn't know the wild plants because it's the last thing you learn after years of learning survival. And, uh, but it is my favorite and it always will be. And the other question from Kutzwert is, how much did that week prepping change the outcome of the show? A lot, an awful lot. I mean, that's stuff that David Halliday taught me in the Arizona desert, uh, made for scenes. And that's what happens is these different instructors would show me something out there. And I alluded to earlier to the fact that they'd be showing me something that I can't use. But when they showed me something I didn't know, and it was amazing, and I'm thinking, this is gonna look so cool on camera. Uh, then it changed the outcome of the show because I would be thinking, I want to make sure I get to doing this, you know, uh, making the grass mat in, in the Arizona episode or um, certain things I gathered in Costa Rica or, or how about the, um, the fire in Papua New Guinea where I did it with uh, the vine. Those things could make an entire scene for me and an entire scene can make an entire episode for me. So yes, what I learned from the guides, ultimate respect because they gave me great, great information. That's what I was there to do. Learn from them and teach you. Darkest before the dawn. Uh, hey, Les, just wondering, how many guitars harmonicas do I own? Lost count, of my, lost count of both of them. Probably 200 harmonicas, probably 50, 60 guitars. Danielle McSee, how much of the dog's meat did I really meet? Did I really eat? I must know. I don't know. Whatever you saw on camera, that's what I ate. Probably all of it. I was hungry. Kaylin, what was involved in recovering after one of these filming weeks? I've always wondered that. Nothing. Nothing at all. It was fine. In fact, I felt like a million dollars at the end at the end of those weeks. It was like mandatory fasting. I came out trim and in fighting shape. And uh, it really, that's all it was, was a mandatory fast for a week, drinking lots of water if I could. And uh, I felt good. Recovery was not required. <laughs> Recover, recovery's a lot more required after a week's vacation doing nothing uh, than it is spending a week in the bush. Aggie goes outdoors. I'm curious as to why the use of dissolves is frowned upon. Oh, interesting question. It was a, not a bone of contention at all, um, but I know Barry Farrell as the editor. I just felt that it was an old trope, you know, just dissolve, nice and soft and gentle and smooth. Um, but when you're trying to create energy and you're trying to show energy in, a, you know, then, then dissolves don't work so well. They slow the mind, the eye down, they slow the mind down. You get into a sense of relaxed uh, being when we're showing survival. It should be more intense. So you've got 
harder cuts and things like that. It's a little more intense and jarring. And you, know, you don't think of it that way when you're watching it. But so dissolves aren't frowned upon. They just have their place. All devices that we use in filmmaking has its place. The first raw episode was um, Labrador. Uh, however, uh, I, I, I went back and watched Amazon, Kalahari, and Africa. And I remember looking at them and saying, who the hell destroyed these edits? Uh, because literally, out of the 240 odd edits in, in the episode, there were 240 dissolves. Uh, and <laughs> I remember we talking to Max and Andy, and I said, who put all these dissolves in? Because I didn't know how to quite approach it. And so they said, oh, the other editor. I go, well, we got to get rid of them because th this, is, this, is, this is not the kind of show that is deserving of, of dissolves on every shot. Too many productions. I mean, just look at reality TV today, including all those survival stuff. My God. I mean, you'd think it was just, you know, a bunch of, you know, wedding videographer editors gone wild because it's use of every single little, you know, trope and bell and whistle and just, it's constant. A device in editing and a device in filmmaking needs to be motivated. The stuff I did for Survivor Man was motivated by the necessity of the fact that I was alone and didn't have another person running a camera or operating sound. So there were necessities that made me shoot a certain way. That brought content to my editor, Barry Farrell, who had the necessity of working with footage that is not filmed like any other series on television. That necessitates him using certain devices or not using certain devices to tell the story. And that is um, yeah, a little bit of the utilizing of devices, filmmaking 101 for you there. Ollie Matson, how do I deal with the fear and anxiety, if you have it, of sleeping alone in the woods? Hmm, you grow comfortable with it. Um, I'm only nervous, if you will, for about three nights. Then I'd walk out there without a flashlight into the depths of the dark forest and not even worry about it. Uh, but it, it takes me about three nights to get really comfortable. Uh, so fear and anxiety is not something that I feel. But I will tell you this, a little trick, it's a good one if you've got kids too, by the way, is um, when you're sitting there at your shelter and it's getting darker and darker and darker, look all around you. There's a rock over there. There's a certain kind of tree right there. The lake is over there. There's another rock face back there. Remember all of that. Now it's pitch black. Guess what? It's still all there. It's still all exactly the same. Nothing is morphed. Nothing's turned into a monster. There's no creatures who are lurking, just waiting to pounce on you at night. Everything is exactly the same, and it will be all the way through the night until morning. That's the truth of it. Are certain animals more nocturnal and they're out and about? Yes, sure. But even though if they're sneaking, you can't really hear them for the most part, you can hear a lot of animals coming from a long ways off. If you're quiet and listening, it's amazing what you can hear. But remember, here's another tip. A mouse sounds like a rat, a rat sounds like a raccoon, a raccoon sounds like a bear, and a bear sounds like Bigfoot. So just remember that, that sound is amplified, and, uh, and, and don't get so worried. I've heard bugs, I've, well here's a great one, toads, toads and frogs hopping through dry leaves sounds like, you know, could be somebody walking not too far off. It's, it's funny, I, in fact one time I thought somebody was walking. And it was just a big Costa Rican toad like that, that big. So that's how I deal with fear and anxiety. It's knowledge. It's like knowing how to, how to work with, uh, how, or not how to work with, it's like knowing how to react to a black bear. I saw um, a video once on Instagram or something like that of three girls and this bear that was up on its back legs sniffing and smelling and licking this one girl who just stood there and I thought, no, it's a black bear. All three of you should have banded together, scared the crap out of that bear so it doesn't become habitualized to the fact that, well, humans don't even run away. I'm going to do some taste testing here. Now, that was the wrong thing that that person did. What should happen is scaring that bear away so it goes, oh, those things walking on two legs are scary. I don't want to go near them. Uh, and they don't feed me. And they didn't throw food down on the ground. Uh, so knowledge, knowledge is how you dispel fear and anxiety in the wilderness. Daniel Clasans, why an axe in the forest but a machete in the jungle? Absolutely based on the greenery, the foliage, the trees, the wood, whatever you're going to be cutting. The jungle uh, 
trees that you're going to be working with slice so smooth and clean with a machete, uh, such as palm trees and so on, that, that, that that's why it works so well there, the big, huge palm fronds that you use for roofing. But you do that in Canada, you know, you can blaze a trail with a machete, but you're not chopping anything down. You need the heavier weight. Um, so the axe or the machete is dependent upon the foliage. It's really as simple as that. Can't flex a PhD. I like to know the coolest stories that just didn't translate well to camera. When I had a crazy experience and couldn't wait to share it with the world, but then the editors or others told you it just wouldn't play well to a home audience. Oh man, I'd have to ask Barry that one. I don't recall. What I can tell you is that I would often say to Barry, when, here's a, it's a tangent, but sort of answers, but your question, but not really. In the beginning, about 10 times in a row, I'd say to Barry Farrow when I first started working with him, well, why, why didn't you use this, like, show me this scene. I'm, I, I shot this scene. It should work. Barry would be like, no, nah, it didn't work. Well, let me see it, All right? Because I don't know him that well, and i, I got to figure this out, right? What it's going to be like to work with this guy. By the 10th time of him being absolutely right every single time, I never questioned him again for the next 10 years. So when I would say, hey, why didn't you put in that scene of me building the snowshoes? You know, and he'd say, it didn't work at all. I'd go, oh, bummer, okay, move on. Uh, so I don't know, there were lots of little scenes. Um, it was more that there were a lot of little scenes, little things that just uh, didn't work. Why didn't they work? Because they were just, they were boring. I didn't shoot them well. I mean, on, on occasion, the cameras might glitch or something like that. I lost sound or, or something, but the um, usual reason was I shot it and it was just kind of boring and we wouldn't keep it in. All right, last question, Jeff Lamb. I think you forgot because of your busy schedule, but I asked several months ago about if it's cold, raining, and already getting dark, which is more important, building a fire or building a shelter? Also, how to build a fire and maintain while it's raining. I've been reading, I read the books about getting dry tinder from the center of the wood, but I really want your take on it because you'll always be the goat. All right, well, thank you, Jeff Lamb. Um, so, really good question. So difficult to say, well, the answer is build a shelter or the answer is build a fire. It all depends on your circumstances. I'm not copying out, but it is about variables, 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 variables. What are your variables involved here? Um, what kind of rain is it? If it's just misting and spitting a bit, I'm going to get a big fire going, you know. If it's, you know, a torrential downpour, I need that roof over my head. Uh, what material is around? How is it going to take me a half an hour to build that roof or is it going to take me four hours to build that roof? Um, so everything depends. It's easy to build a roof in the Amazon jungle, for example, with palm fronds. Let's get that roof up there, you know, and it buckets down rain there, but in another place where it might only be a little misty and the, the, the foliage isn't conducive to making roofs quickly that are waterproof, maybe it'd be better to get a big fire going. Uh, in the wintertime, uh, if it's not freezing wet rain or anything like that happening, then I love to have a six foot fire going to sleep beside the fire. So it really depends on the variables. And I wish I could just give you the definitive answer. It's like asking what's the best tool to take out in a survival situation. Depends. Where are you going? How long are you going to be there? What time of year is it? What are the circumstances? And on and on it goes. So that's your answer there, Jeff. But um, as far as um, how would I build a fire and maintain while it's raining? You know, I really, I, I'm going to do a, a, a how-to episode on getting a fire going in the rain and maintaining it. And I'm going to pick a day where it's pouring because it is absolutely possible. I used to say that the mark of a really good outdoor guide is you've been on the trip for four and a half days. It's been raining every single day and you're able to erect a tarp system that everybody can stand under, get a big fire going, pull out the scotch and the dark chocolate and get smiles on people's faces. That's the mark of a good guide. It's the same thing in survival. You should be able to get a fire going in the rain and maintain it in the rain. This nonsense about, well, it's raining, we're gonna have to just cook everything on a little mini stove, can't get a fire going, that's, that's, that's what that is, that's nonsense. I don't care how long it's been raining for, there is always dry wood. Where? Underneath rock overhangs, underneath logs, underneath things, inside things. And well, yeah, but you get a little bit. Yeah, you're going to get a little bit, and you're going to get lots of little bits, and it's going to take you... I've taken as long as two hours, two and a half hours, maybe longer, to gather what I needed in the rain to get a good fire going. But I take that time, and that's how I get the fire going. But people think that they should be able to gather for 15 minutes, and then they're 
upset because they can't get a fire going. They burn up all their little pieces of toilet paper or something like that. It's ridiculous. You just getting a great fire going in the pouring rain and bad weather just requires concentration and determination and just diligence. You do not give up. Go everywhere until you have a big pile of dry stuff that you now have protected and you get an area that's protected and you get in there and you get that fire going by whatever, me whatever method you're using. Fire bow, striker, or blowtorch. I don't care. It's hard to do it but it is absolutely possible and it is the mark of a good guide. And all you outdoor guides that are out there that might hear this, remember that. You want to be a great guide and you take people whitewater canoeing or hiking in the mountains or sea kayaking. Make sure that you can do that after four and a half days of rain. Tarp, chocolate, scotch, big fire. And then you get that mark of being an awesome guide and you'll be loved forever for it by your clients. They will, they will go home saying, yeah, and then they did this and they did that. They'll be talking about it for years. I digress. I miss my days of being a canoe guide. I don't miss babysitting people, but I miss being a canoe guide. Okay, wanted to save this for the end. Guys, here's my stuff. Hey everyone. Allow me to interrupt myself. I don't really like hawking merchandise and swag, but you guys do ask all the time where you can get certain items. For example, check this out, Hennessy hammock. I put a lot of time and effort into designing this hammock with Hennessy. It's their top hammock. It's an amazing, beautiful, comfortable hammock to enjoy for all of your adventures out there. So just check it out. It's got a full size tarp, which is a big thing for me. It's got insulation and I love it. So we've got the Hennessy hammocks. Of course, for years I've been in a phenomenal relationship with Hella of Norway, Hella Knives. And this is our signature knife, of course, the Tamagami. These knives are handmade. In fact, I've been there to this very ancient factory where I don't know how long, how many, it's well over 100 years that they've been operating and every single handle is handmade. All of the grinding, everything is done by hand. And these knives are absolutely beautiful. I also now have a brand new relationship and you will see these items, new forging tools that I'm designing with LT Wright Knives out of Ohio. And also, Chef Paul Rogowski of Wild Harvest uh, has the signature Chef Paul Rogowski kitchen knife collection. Those are a big thrill to me to have these beautiful items that we spent years designing and I still have them available for you. However, if you wanna go more the route of just enjoying the Survivor Man, legacy, if you will, then of course, go to my website, lestow.ca, go to the shop page, right there you've got everything. All the swag, all the merch, such as my manual on survival. This is if you wanna get into survival, this book is meant to be a way to walk you through step by step because I deal a lot more with concepts than I do with specifics because that's really important. Once you understand the concepts of fire by friction, uh, for example, you can do it depending on where you are because I can't give you the, the advice on how to do it here in Canada and hope that it's also going to work down in the jungle. Things are different. So I've always been very proud of this book, Survive. So that is my survival manual. Also, if you weren't aware, I've got the book, Will to Live. I wrote this book to, well, it's kind of for a lot of fun. I took my 10 favorite survival stories, such as Chris McCandles Into the Wild or the Robertson family and the life raft, and I basically dissect them with this book. I, I, I tear apart the story, I go through everything, and I even give them a little bit of a grade on, and, on how I thought they did. So I really enjoyed writing this book. It's, it's a real easy read, it's a fast read, but I think there's a lot of insight there for you into all of these different examples of people who have either survived or perished. Speaking of books, so honored. So thrilled, so proud that Wild Outside, my first children's book, has won the Yellow Cedar Award, best nonfiction children's book in Canada for ages seven to 14. I tell stories from Survivor Man, lessons learned during those uh, expeditions and adventures, and there are even activities they can do in the out of doors. So there you go. My new book, my children's book, Wild Outside, Around the World with Survivor Man, has just won the Yellow Seed Award, and I'm up for another award yet. And in keeping with stuff that's going on right now, we are also up for an award for our season one recipe book from the series Wild Harvest. And if you've never caught the series Wild Harvest, check this out. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, 
Can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Up, hey there. Oh, go on. Now the job's getting fun. This dish is a showcase of how great these forged ingredients come together. It's the best when it's its own flavor. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. Tell me that doesn't look awesome. Two seasons right now, 26 episodes. In the United States, it's on PBS stations. You can also get it on this YouTube channel. In Canada, Cottage Life TV. In Sweden and uh, Norway on Matt Canelan. It's on National Geographic. Asia, which includes China and India. So my Wild Harvest series is playing around the world now. And we, with every single season, create a recipe book based on the recipes that we show you in the actual shows themselves. So that's Wild Harvest. And of course, if you want the DVD, you can get that on this website as well, lesjob.ca. And let's not forget too, that I'm a musician. The CDs themselves are available on the website. The next release will be the re-release of the Mother Earth album on vinyl. But Go on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to music, or on my website, you can go to the shop page, you can pick up all of my CDs. So this is the last one. This is my 20th anniversary selection. Check it out. Every film I've ever made, 76 films in all, all of the Survivor Man, Bigfoot, Beyond Survival, music documentaries, one-off films such as the award-winning La Lache about the school shooting up in Canada and a healing canoe trip. This is my 20th anniversary, uh, 76 films. And people that have picked this up have raved about it. And I'm really proud that I can say I've got 20 years of anything, to be honest with you. That's available for you as well on that Les Stroud shop page. Okay, that's me hawking my stuff. Back to the video.